No, there are very few people trying to combine the two. And uh, it, when uh, trying to think about that question, I uh, could immediately see uh, three advantages or perhaps three groups of advantages or contributions that uh, my brand of linguistics could make towards translation studies. And uh, these are uh, arranged in a chronological order. So first, understanding the source text. Uh, basically, uh, cognitive linguistics can tell us uh, quite a lot about uh, what meaning is like. And their favorite comparison uh, brings us close to the theory of visual uh, perception and it works like the classic work by Rudolf Warnheim, uh, whose main uh, assumption was that even when we look at things, we never actually see them in their entirety. There is always one aspect of, uh, of whatever we're looking at. Uh, and the rest comes from other observations and the notion of an object, uh, which you can say is meaning, only comes as the sum total of different perceptions made from different angles and different points of view. And this basically applies to language as well. And if you look at meaning from this particular point of view, you have to accept that meaning is conceptualization, which is the next step after the actual process of perception, not only visual perception, but or sensuous perception, but perception as such. Mm -hmm. Now, then the result of that is subjectivity uh, already at the uh, stage of production and then at the uh, stage of interpretation of the product offered by, by somebody. Now, that obviously to my mind is the problem that uh, translation theorists have been trying to cope with uh, more or less successfully. Uh, the problem of subjectivity. Exactly, yes. exactly, mm -hmm. right. Uh, on various levels, mm -hmm. on the level of text, on the level of discourse, on the level of actual interaction, and so on and so forth. And I think we can be very helpful in here. Then, meaning for a cognitive linguist is seen as a sum total of what they call a dimensions of imagery. Mm -hmm. So it is not only the relation between uh, what we uh, want to talk about and what we actually say, but it's much more complicated by bringing into the picture the point of view, a perspective, which is the view that opens from that point of view, the distance between you and the object, or a, the extension of your visual field, and so on and, and so forth. And this obviously comes under, and has been coming out under very different guises mm -hmm. in, in, in most of the translation theories I'm uh, familiar with. Then, number two, would be a help in deciding what is universal, because for a cognitive linguist, investigating linguist, uh, language is ultimately investigating human cognition. And there would be some universes dictated by the physical makeup of a human being. Mm -hmm. uh, on top of that, there are things which are culture and or language specific. And to differentiate which is which and how to cope with one or the other is also a pretty pertinent question to ask in translation studies, to my mind. Then, number three, perhaps most importantly, is the distinction between what is convention and what is innovation. And how uh, what we know about uh, the conventional aspects of language can be bent extended, modified, in order to provide this wonderful variety of unique productions. Right? So these would be the, um, the three advantages, I could say, might influence the first stage, which is understanding. Then, uh, when we think about translating as a process rather than the product, uh, there would be a, the ability to compare individual perceptions and conceptualizations in order to uh, attempt, say, typologies or taxonomies of text genres 
or speaker mm -hmm. genres and things like that. Uh, then, uh, by uh, trying to find uh, the relative salience of uh, elements building up uh, verbal expression, cognitive linguistics can help to establish uh, what uh, some theorists, notably the Polish uh, uh, poet com translator Barancia calls the dominant, which is the most important aspect in a particular text, which has to be rendered even at the cost of other things, which is uh, unavoidable. Mm -hmm. huh? Now, if you look at, uh, at verbal expression as uh, the arrangement of figures and grounds, uh, salient elements and less salient elements. And cognitive linguistics tells you how to do that. Mm -hmm. You can find that dominant uh, with some, uh, perhaps, uh, level of reli reliability. Hmm? And then, uh, the, uh, then they would be looking for, and I uh, hesitate whether one is still allowed to use the word equivalent, but I mean it's difficult to go without it. Mm -hmm. So, the, uh, uh, according to a cognitive linguist, an equivalent uh, would be the sum total of all those dimensions of imagery. Right? And I think this is... This in, is in two different languages. Yeah. Yes. Equivalence yes. And is, it is possible mm, in, uh, yes. within this perspective. Yes. Okay. Uh, if you define it as cognitive linguistics defines it, when meaning is conceptualization. Eh? So then you look for equivalence, not on the level of uh, structure, not uh, on the level of uh, discourse, but on the level of conceptualization. Eh? You try mm -hmm. to, uh, to find how the original author or writer or speaker saw what he saw. Can you eh? give some simple example of... E Yes. Of this conceptualization. Yes. Uh, now, to, to use a very basic example, which, uh, which uh, refers to a grammatical structure. Right? Uh, when you uh, say in English, uh, the woman entered uh, the library, well, this is, couldn't have anything simpler than that, right? The uh, uh, definite article in front of the noun tells you that the conceptualizer recognizes the referent. Huh? Mm -hmm. Now, in uh, languages like Polish, which have no uh, morphological markers for definiteness or indefiniteness, you've got to do something about it. In other words, you must put yourself in a situation of someone who sees the object and recognizes it, Mm -hmm. Plus, presumably, also assumes that whoever is addressing recognizes the referent as well. Huh? You've got a choice, uh, which is a word order choice. Huh? Right. And, uh, and uh, on uh, some uh, level, say the logical level, uh, the order subject, verb, um, adverbial of place, or verb, adverbial of place, subject, it's the same, right? But from our point of view, it's obviously not the same. Now, this is a very simple example, but there would be uh, myriads and millions yeah. of them. So that, that's an example of, of the conceptualization being the same in English and Polish, but the grammatical means yeah. being different. Yes. yes. Okay. And if you only stay on the level of, uh, of semantics in the traditional sense, mm. I mean, it does not matter which word order you actually use, right? And the learner would probably use the prototypical order, subject, verb, uh, adverbial. Eh? Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Now, you can say that on a certain crude level, uh, these are equivalent, but you've missed out today. Right? Okay. Now, um, in the lecture yesterday, I gave another example, the choice, the obvious choice between the English come and go. Right? I'll come to the bar at 1.30 right? mm -hmm. it is different from I'll go to the bar at 1.30, even though ultimately the effect of both acts is exactly the same. Yeah? Right. So, uh, okay, 
uh, and we would assume then there's just different languages give different resources for yes. Yes. assisting yeah. this conceptualization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it is, uh, I mean, Chomsky had this, uh, this idea of idealized uh, native speaker mm -hmm. whose only shortcoming was that he did not exist really, mm -hmm. right? Yes. <laughs> no. uh, co the cognitive linguists speak about conventionalized or generalized observers. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the uh, metaphorical uh, explanation of that would be that in order to uh, be uh, able to communicate successfully now you, uh, in another language, you've got to borrow uh, spectacles of, uh, of an average native speaker of that language and mm -hmm. put them on your nose and look at the world through them. Okay. Yeah? Uh, now, uh, uh, then third, it can help to as assess the products. Okay. And this is what I, uh, what I hoped to show yesterday. Mm -hmm. When I compared the impressionistic um, assessments of uh, literary scholars uh, with the uh, tiny little but hard facts of language that we can point to mm -hmm. and, and say things like, now that critic thinks the translation failed at this particular point because he must have intuitively noticed that, this right. or that, okay? So these would be the, the advantages. It won't do things for you, of course. It won't mm. is say anything about norms, because you can't, and it's not interested in that. Mm -hmm. It won't uh, tell you um, how, to, uh, how to please your client, okay. <laughs> and things <laughs> like that. Uh, how to feel about uh, market demands and uh, educate to them, this it won't do, but it's not its purpose. In terms of the history of translation studies, it seems like almost a return to linguistics that was used prescriptively, far more prescriptively in the mm -hmm. sense of contrast of linguistics, but attached to the hermeneutic tradition, mm -hmm. which comes through 19th century German yeah. writers, yeah. through phenomenology, yeah. the Gestalt ideas seem yes. to be here. Well, the cognitivists love all that, so right. come back to it, obviously. Yes, so, so cognitive linguistics is coming out of that that tradition? I, among other, uh, because mm -hmm. uh, it's been, uh, now, uh, the creed of, uh, it, uh, of cognitivist uh, scholars summed up as what they call is the cognitive commitment mm -hmm. and the gen commitment for generalization. They've got two of mm -hmm. them. And it says that uh, y your uh, theory being a general theory of the human cognition should be able to draw from all disciplines which deal with the same subject matter and try to build in a comprehensive, solid building out of all those bricks. Mm -hmm. And they love Gestalt psychology. They love people like Wundt and Humboldt mm -hmm. uh, or Sapir and Wolf. Yes. But it's not going in circles. It's always a spiral okay. because hopefully we know more and more. So it, it's... it's uh, never finding yourself back at where you started. She's just looking for inspiration and adding what we know. Yeah, I, I'm interested, in, you're in Krakow in, in Poland. I, does this tap into a Polish tradition oh, in yes, translation studies? So. Yes. And this is why we uh, took to cognitive linguistics like fish to water. Right. Because, okay. now there was a short period of intervention. And I'll tell you uh, later if you're interested how, uh, how uh, generative grammar um, influenced me personally and linguists in Poland. But what the cognitive linguists say, like Lakov and Lenneker, mm. strikes a very compassionate note in us because it is what we were supposed to learn at school, I mean my generation, mm -hmm. traditional linguistics, mm -hmm. going back to sound uh, philosophical uh, foundations, providing this elusive human factor, which Chomsky took so much trouble to kill. <laughs> right, and eradicate okay. the deplorable re results, of course. <laughs> so, so this is uh, now people uh, would look at this uh, new uh, stuff and would say, no, it's familiar, I know it. No, mm -hmm. I've always thought that. Well, while we're on that, one of the questions that we always ask is, um, 
what were you doing when you were 22, 23, 24? Mm -hmm. you know, were you already in linguistics? Were you already Fortunately doing this not. kind of linguistics? Fortunately not. Even though at, at breakfast today, uh, when I told one of the guests there that I was twice her age, she said, oh, people don't live that long. <laughs> 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 so I do. And when I was 23, I have just graduated from the Department of English Studies in Krakow and had no specialization, no profession at all. Because English studies uh, were the old-fashioned philology. So I knew a couple of names and a couple of dates. And I even knew one sentence in Old English with all the morphology. Very useful. Yes, yes very useful indeed. <laughs> And then it, this was precise, it, this was a very important year because this was the year, uh, my graduation year, was the year when Chomsky published his aspects of theory of syntax and when he first admitted that uh, words and language not only behaves according to algorithm but means, has <laughs> some meaning. And I, I was quite happy to realize that because this is what I somehow have always suspected and <laughs> during my, my career. And then I went straight to Edinburgh. And in Edinburgh, I felt and learned the hard way uh, how translation means translating cultures. Were you working on translation then or no. in linguistics? No. This was, uh, I went to study under John Lyons mm -hmm. and was, uh, they called me a budding linguist. I was basically a rebel because I, I hated what I, what I was doing because I couldn't see much sense in planting all those generative trees. Right? Mm. But anyway, in order to be able to get a job, I had to go through that. Mm -hmm. And it, this was my first trip abroad, and I did not understand anything. Anything, nothing. I, uh, first of all, they'd been working hard to eradicate my beautiful Silesian hard rrr sound. <laughs> and then I was met by a British council uh, officer at the station, and he handed me uh, some documents that he said, here are your papers, dear. <laughs> and I thought, oh my God, who's crazy, <laughs> right? And then it all went like that, the cars on the wrong side of, of the road and uh, people in the students' hostel uh, behaving in a strange way. They're Scottish. Uh, but the high <laughs> table, uh, the high table, when they would say, now, where do you come from? They would say, Poland. And the lady would say, quite near to China, isn't it? <laughs> and then she would say, now take some of that yellow stuff, it's mustard. Can you repeat that? Mustard. So, so this is how I started thinking about translation. And then I came okay. back home, yes, yes. And, I, and I did all kinds of things which brought me close to translation. First, I did a lot of coaching because I had to make my living. And I found out that I punished my students exactly for what I find the best poets and writers are doing all along, breaking conventions. Mm -hmm. So, so I wanted to know why. 